Nora. It is a great pleasure to be here today at the Biohacker Summit 2019. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the CEO of the company, I'm only the CSO. Our be beloved CSO, uh, sorry, CEO, Tom Stapps, uh, couldn't make it, so he sent me instead. But as you can probably tell from uh, my facial hair and southern accent, I'm still not quite British. Uh, so you'll need to do with me today instead. Uh, but hopefully, I can show you some of the super cool stuff that we've been up to uh, at Chronomics, uh, where I'm the CSO and, and co-founder. Um, so essentially, today, I'm here to hopefully convince you that epigenetics is the next big frontier in health. So we're, lo we're living way longer. Uh, human lifespan has nearly doubled during the last 200 years. It has mainly been due to things such as improvements in water, food, antibiotics, good access to healthcare, and yet we're living way sicker. There is a massive rise in the burden of non-communicable diseases, things such as different types of cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative conditions, cardiovascular disease. Good news is that a lot of this stuff is actually preventable or largely preventable through lifestyle interventions. And that is the main reason why our medical and scientific community is moving from trying to extend our lifespan or the time that we live towards actually trying to extend the health span or the time that we are free of disease. In order to accomplish this, a paradigm shift in medicine really needs to happen. We need to move from the reactive treatment of one specific disease to the proactive prevention of multiple diseases at the same time. This is the world that we live in. We diagnose diseases one by one, and then we treat them. But this doesn't stop us from developing other diseases over time. And the reason is because we're not targeting the underlying risk factors of many of these diseases. So for example, in this case, if we were to target risk factor A, and we were to be able to measure it, we'd be able to try to reduce the risk of developing three diseases at the same time. One of these core risk factors is actually the aging process. And aging is probably one of the most fascinating and also most complex topics that biologists are trying to hack in the 21st century. So what is aging then? Traditionally, it is defined as the time-dependent functional decline that affects most living organisms. And more specifically, scientists have characterized different aspects of the aging process that they have called hallmarks. So these are things that happen across many layers of your cells and bodies, things such as damage in your DNA, which can create genomic instability, the shortening of your telomeres that some of you might have heard of, things such as the aggregation of misfolded proteins inside your cells, and also broader things such as global dysregulation of nutrient-sensing pathways, the exhaustion of the stem cells that are regenerating your tissues, the dysfunction of your mitochondrial, et cetera, et cetera. What we are interested in is, is in this layer of information, the epigenetic layer of information. And over the last years, it has become clear that epigenetics could constitute a hub in the entire aging process. And that would be the focus of the rest of my talk. So what is epigenetics then? Epigenetics is essentially the molecular information that controls how our DNA code or our genetics are being read. So some epigenetic marks will be able to turn on certain genes at a specific time point, and others will be able to turn them off. So it's essentially controlling how your DNA is being read over time, space, and also across different cell types. Epigenetics is the reason why or behind the fact that, for example, a neuron cell, even though it has exactly the same core DNA as your skin cell, can perform a complete different function because it expresses a complete different subset of genes. So there are different types of epigenetic marks. DNA methylation is one of them, and there are other things known, for example, as histone modifications, 
which are chemical marks that are attached to the proteins that recover your DNA. So at Chronomics, we focus on DNA methylation. And we think DNA methylation is the ultimate biomarker for health. Let me try to explain you why. On your left-hand side, you can see a DNA sequence. Hopefully, yeah. So it's made of four types of letters, A, C, T, and G. And you can imagine that you have books and books and pages and pages of this code in each one of your cells. One of these letters, the C, is known as cytosine. And there you can see how that looks like uh, with a chemical formula. What happens to those cytosines sometimes is that some enzymes or molecular tools known as DNA methyltransferases, they add a methyl group to them, a chemical tag that changes how your DNA is being read. The important thing about this is that lifestyle and environmental factors can heavily influence this pattern. So by quantifying them, for example, we can see how different types of diet change your methylation patterns, or different types of smoke, how they leave the signatures, or even the specific types of exercise that you do can affect your underlying DNA methylation pattern. So obviously, this is very exciting to build biomarkers, but it doesn't only stop there. DNA methylation also captures our genetic background. So by quantifying DNA methylation patterns, we can also measure how your core genetics, which are fixed since you're born, interact with these different lifestyle and environmental factors. Importantly, DNA methylation also has memory. So it doesn't change super quick. Uh, there are still some circadian changes, for example, but the stuff that we focus on, because it changes over months and years, it allows us to quantify the medium and long-term risk of disease. And finally, it can be measured using high-throughput technologies. So in our case, we use something called next-generation DNA sequencing. And we have adapted this protocol to a something called bisulfite sequencing, which allows us to differentiate chemically the differences between those cytosines that are modified from those cytosines that are methylated. And more importantly, we can quantify more than 20 million of these cytosines and assess their methylation status from each sample that we collect. So you can imagine that's approximately one million times the amount of information that you have in the screen. This has already yielded tremendous progress in order to understand and measure the aging process. And some of you might have heard about the concept of epigenetic clocks. So these are essentially the most accurate biomarkers that we have for the aging process in humans and also other species. And they're essentially DNA methylation-based models that allow us to quantify your biological age. Your biological age is a much more accurate metric of your age-associated risk with, when compared with your chronological age. And it's already starting a revolution in the way that we understand the development of new anti-aging therapies. Because the main problem with anti-aging therapies has actually been measuring the core aging process. Some of you might be aware of that around one month ago, the first hint that body's biological age could be reversed was published. So this is a study that focused on basically giving three different types of drugs all together in a cocktail for people over a year, and then measuring the biological age before and after that. And they observed that even though it's a small sample size, still nine people, uh, we were able to see a trend that looks very promising uh, for the scientific community. And it's also starting to create a lot of attention into the potential of these new anti-aging drugs. So I would totally recommend you that you read this paper uh, from, from the group that did it. Uh, it's definitely a milestone in the field. So what have we been up to? So our research background starts uh, in the University of Cambridge in the UK. So there we were developing certain things in the field of epigenetic clocks. So one of the things that we developed was uh, what is known as the first multi-tissue epigenetic clock in mouse. So we were the first ones being able to predict biological age across multiple tissues in this model organism and therefore trigger a revolution in the way that we can study and understand the aging process. We've been also researching the mechanisms behind the ticking rate of the epigenetic clock in humans and proposed 
some new hypothesis about what could be behind in our tissues and that could be creating the aging process. So what do we do acronomics now? Acronomics, we build actionable DNA methylation based biomarkers for the main risk factors of non-communicable disease. So going back to the picture that I saw you at the beginning, we've already created our biological age biomarker, but we haven't stopped there. So aging is only the beginning. Aging is only the first main risk factor that we need to measure. There are many other things that we can start to quantify and track over time that haven't been described before. So in this table, you can see a bit more detail into what we have already released for our users. So as I said, we have, for example, biological age, which measures the age-associated risk and is associated with all cause mortality and many other diseases. Uh, but we have also expanded to other things such as metabolic status, which is essentially quantifying your molecular BMI or the metabolic risk. And it's more associated with other diseases such as obesity, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. We have expanded also to try to quantify chemicals mainly found in tobacco, in the smoke from tobacco and also air pollution that can affect your health. So what we can do is that we can measure the cumulative exposure to these things and the dynamics over time. And finally, we have already released also a measurement for cumulative exposure to alcohol that quantifies not only what you drank in the last biohacker party, but your accumulation over the years. And again, we hope that this serves as tools for people to start to reduce their risk of disease in the future before disease actually manifests. But we are not stopping here, and I'll show you in a second what's coming next. So how do we do it? It's relatively simple when you see in that slide. So essentially what we do is we take a lot of DNA methylation data from a saliva sample. So I said we measure more than 20 million cytosines for the methylation status. And you can imagine this is gigabytes and gigabytes of data that we collect for thousands and thousands of people. And then we apply our machine learning algorithms that are able to go for those complex patterns in the data that humans wouldn't be able to understand to useful, actionable genomic insights that we can all use at our homes to try to improve our health. A key and very important thing about what we do acronomics is that this becomes essentially the very first repeatable DNA test in the market. So what this means is that because DNA methylation patterns change over time, we can actually quantify and optimize how the different lifestyle interventions that we're taking are having an effect in reducing these risk factors. So in this example here, for example, for your biological age over time, you could sample yourself now and then undertake all sorts of lifestyle interventions, things that go from diet to you know, the latest anti-aging drug candidates, different types of exercise, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing here in the biohacking conference, and therefore have a way to quantify where this stuff is really managing to reduce your risk of disease in the long term. And as I said, we're not stopping here. We have built an automated machine that is able to optimize epigenetic biomarker discovery. So using the data from our users, we want to empower more our users with new insights. And it's still quite confidential <laughs> what we are up to. Uh, but I can tell you that there is a lot of stuff that is probably going to blow your minds in the next months. Uh, so we're essentially quantifying comple complex risk factors that no one else has been able to see before just because no one else has sequenced those parts of the epigenomes in humans in the entire history. So if you're interested in things related to mental health, sleep, the immune system, just stay in touch. So we are economics, and we are improving lives by making health actionable. I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is super interesting. Uh, I have a question. As a journalist, I'll be writing stories about DNA tests you can do at home for yourself. And I don't know if it's only in Finland or also in other countries, but the Finnish audience is quite skeptical and scared. I've had um, quite a lot of comments about that I don't want to know my risks. I don't want to know that much about my health. Is it normal that people react like that? And what should we be telling them? Is, can yeah. you know too much? 
No, I agree. Uh, I think these are all very new technologies and it's a complete human and natural reaction to be scared of them at the very beginning. Um, what I will tell these people is that, first of all, you know, it's not as scary. Uh, we're humans besides, you know, behind what is really happening behind the scenes. So we really care about, you know, giving our users the best thing so they can improve their health. So the benefits clearly, you know, go beyond the risk of these technologies. Um, I think specifically about what we do in epigenetics is the fact that, you know, the risk that we are giving you is actionable. So it's not a death sentence. It's just telling you where you are at now, and it's always something that you can improve. And that makes a massive difference with, in my opinion, genetic testing approaches, where the problem there is that you have the knowledge, but you don't necessarily have the tools to change that fate. So what we offer you is an updated measurement of what you can do to keep improving your health, and it's always possible to, to improve it. So at what age should you start to do this kind of testing? Well, I mean, the way that we think about this is that people should be doing since babies can speed in a tube. <laughs> uh, obviously, the idea of this is that, you know, human studies have been very biased to a specific ages, a specific populations. And uh, I think, you know, it is very interesting to be building one of the first cohorts in the world that start from age zero until people die. So we really want to, you know, make people conscious about their health from the very beginning and empower them with the latest data insights to, to action them. As a mother, I think it would be super cool when you have your baby to start from that point, you know, to know early on these things, because then you can maybe make a change in the health of your child early on. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and if we think about it, we're already doing it with other types of health data. So it's not novel in that sense, where we go you know, to the doctor, they also do tests for, for our kids. And, you know, it's not an epigenetic test, but it might be a specific type of blood test. So this is just adding another dimension, you know, using the latest technologies and the latest uh, data that we can, we can get to, to make that happen. Thank you so much for an interesting, right. really interesting speech. Thank you. Nora. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.